The Gospel reading today is from Mark, the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing that what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why do you trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, kum, which means... Little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, most of you know by now that uh, periodically I like to use uh, jokes or humor or funny stories in my preaching and in my teaching, and hopefully most of the time uh, to make some kind of uh, a point in my preaching. Now, as pastors, it is um, kind of, uh, you have to be pretty careful in knowing what kind of jokes you can tell uh, from the pulpit, right? Uh, There was uh, one time back in 2003, I was in my congregation in Scottsdale, and uh, I told a joke about somebody who had recently died. And I got a little, uh, I got some laughter, uh, but it was maybe some awkward laughter, and I'll tell you the joke this morning. Uh, It was back in 2003, there was the death of somebody in the news that uh, kind of went mostly unnoticed. Uh, It was a man who lived to be 93 years old. His name was Larry LaPrize. And Larry LaPrize was famous for being the author of The Hokey Pokey. You guys remember The Hokey Pokey? You put your right arm in, you put your right arm out, you put your right arm in, and you shake it all about. You guys can do that, right? We could maybe have you stand and try that, but I guess we won't do that. Uh, But uh, Larry LaPrize died peacefully in his sleep in 2003, and I was up in the pulpit in Scottsdale, and I uh, shared that, and I said, you know, the uh, most difficult thing about his funeral was getting the body into the casket, because they put his left leg in, and his left leg came out, and they put his right leg in, and his right leg came out, and it was just difficult. Now, I got some laughter like I'm getting this morning. But I also had some people afterwards going, whoa, Pastor Tim, really? Uh, I'm not sure you should joke about somebody who died. So there was a little bit of awkward laughter. And uh, I don't know, I hope maybe some people tell some jokes about me when I die. So you can remember that. You can tell some jokes. 
But you know what? Uh, in today's text, we have, I think, the only text where Jesus says something and people laugh. They laugh at him. Now, I believe that Jesus had a sense of humor. I think Jesus liked to tell some funny stories. He liked to go to dinner parties and have a good time. So I think Jesus had a good sense of humor. But the laughter that he got in today's text was not the kind of ha-ha humor laughter. It was maybe more that awkward laughter of uh, disbelief. And he did it at a funeral of all places. Here's the story. The only instance, I think, where Jesus gets laughter. We're in Mark chapter 5. Jesus is surrounded by crowds of people. And out of the crowd comes Jairus. And we heard Jerry read this text from Mark 5. He's a leader in the church. He's a powerful man. And he says to Jesus, with great faith, by the way, Faith is very important in the Gospels, very important in the Gospel of Mark. He says with great faith to Jesus, come quickly because my little daughter, 12 years old, is sick and she's at the point of death. And I trust, I have faith that you are the one who can heal her. So Jesus, filled with compassion as he always is, goes with Jairus to his house. But while Jesus is on the way, he gets distracted. Because there's another need that he needs to meet. And the crowds are kind of following him. And out of the crowd comes a woman who has been hemorrhaging or bleeding for 12 years. She's been going to all kinds of physicians. She can't get it right. She's used up all her money to try to get well. And she acts also with great faith. Notice the faith of Jairus and the faith of this woman who's been bleeding. And she believes that if only I can get close to Jesus and touch his clothing, touch his cloak, then I will be healed. And so she reaches out as she gets close and touches his cloak, touches his clothing, and Jesus feels this power going from him to somebody. He doesn't know who because there's such a crowd. And he says, who was it that touched me? Who was it? And his disciples kind of say, Jesus, are you kidding? There's a bunch of people around here. We don't know. Everybody's touching you. We don't know who it was. And the woman comes to him and says, it was me. It was me. And he says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Be healed. Because of her faith, she was made well. Meanwhile, remember, he's on his way to Jairus' house, whose 12-year-old daughter is sick. And some people from this leader's house, leader of the synagogue's house, Jairus' house, come and they meet Jesus in the crowds and they say, well, no need to bother Jesus any longer because I'm sorry, Jairus, your daughter has died. Your daughter has died, so there's no need for Jesus to come. But what does Jesus do? He goes anyway and he gets to their house and there's a commotion going on, the Bible says. There's weeping, there's crying, as you can guess. A 12-year-old girl had died, very sad, filled with grief. And Jesus, in the midst of that grief, says, don't cry, don't weep, she's only sleeping. She's only sleeping. I'm here, I am, the kingdom of God is at hand, the way, the truth, and the life is present. Don't weep, she's only sleeping. And at that, the people laugh. They laugh at Jesus. Jesus, stop making jokes at a funeral. She's dead. She's not sleeping. Why don't you have a little sensitivity? Why don't you grieve with the parents? Why don't you grieve with Jairus and his wife and with all of us? Don't make jokes, she's only sleeping. And Jesus kind of shakes his head at the unbelief, at the non-faith. And he takes Peter, James, and John, that kind of inner circle of his disciples, and he takes the girl's parents, Jairus, and the little girl's mother, and he leads them into the room where the corpse now lies. And he takes the girl's hand. Remember, he touches a dead body, which was against all of the religious rules and cleanliness laws of his day. But for Jesus, compassion and care, and we see this throughout Mark's gospel as we're reading through it, compassion and care and the giving away of life trumps religious laws and traditions 
all the time for Jesus. So he touches the dead body, which was against the rules. And he says to the girl, little girl, get up. Talitha kum in Aramaic. Little girl, get up. And the little girl gets up. And she starts walking around. And he says, give her something to eat. And everybody is amazed. Their laughter of unbelief. Their mocking laughter at Jesus turned to amazement because in Jesus, the kingdom of God is at hand and is present, and he does this miracle of giving life to this 12-year-old girl. Friends, I know that the world laughs sometimes at Jesus, and the world laughs sometimes at Christians. And our claim that Jesus is stronger than death, that Jesus can defeat the power of death, that Jesus can in your life and in my life bring life from the stuff of death. When there are things going on in your life, what do we see here? We see incredible faith from a woman who has been suffering for 12 years. We see incredible faith from a leader of the synagogue and healing comes. The world laughs at that. Ha! Jesus, yeah, you think Jesus can defeat death? It's just pie in the sky, fanciful. It's not reality. You think Jesus can meet you in your life and bring about life in the midst of brokenness? Ha! We're going to laugh, mock at it. But we know that Jesus enters into our midst and he meets us. I remember uh, back when... In the late 90s, mid to late 90s, we were getting ready to start a mission congregation in Scottsdale, Arizona, just similar to as when Gloria Day started with Pastor Bruce Williams back in the 80s. And I had some friends of mine say, you know, Tim, um, North Scottsdale, they don't build a lot of houses up there and uh, mostly retired people. And I said, no, 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 I think God's vision is for this to be a mix of families and children. They said, don't try it. Don't do it. And they kind of laughed and mocked and said, it won't work. It's going to fail. Now, if that were only up to me or only up to me and my wife, Lori, and the few people who were committed to starting that congregation, it would have failed. But the reality was that that congregation became very prosperous and had in, had in its DNA uh, 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 reaching out, and it's making an incredible difference in the Phoenix area among a lot of different lives. You see, Jesus tells us that all things are possible with him. All things are possible. When it's just us, it's not possible. But when it's with Christ, all things are possible. I remember when we were talking about relocating from a mile and a half down the road to here, there was a little bit of mocking. There was a little bit of laughter going on. I don't think you can do it. I think you're going to get stuck. I think it's too much. It won't happen. We said, no, we're going to put our trust. We're going to put our faith in God. And with God, all things are possible. And we're here now, and I think we're doing pretty well. Thousands of lives being touched in and through you and your ministry here at Gloria Day. You see, with God, all things are possible. Philip Yancey, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, he tells a story in that book about a prostitute who has been working the streets in downtown Chicago. She has done some terrible things in her life that she admits that damaged not only herself and many others, but also damaged her children. And finally, a friend asked her if she had ever thought of going to church to find some help, to get some healing, to get some emotional and spiritual healing. And you know what this prostitute said? She said, church? And she kind of laughed. She laughed at that idea. Why would I ever go there? You, I was already feeling terrible about myself. They just make me feel worse. Friends, Jesus calls us as the body of Christ on earth to not be a place that is filled with judgment, but to be a place that is filled with hospitality and a place that is filled with welcome and a place that is filled with grace 
and a place that is filled with the proclamation of forgiveness and new starts and fresh starts. You see, when Jesus was walking around this earth and on the streets, people like that prostitute in Chicago would flock to him because he had words of love and grace and forgiveness, new life. They had never heard anything like it before. That's what he calls you and me to be. And I'm proud of this congregation at Gloria Day as we continue to strive to not only meet the needs of those that are here, but to reach out and to be welcoming for people of all races, and people of all economic levels. It doesn't matter. For Jesus, Jairus was a strong, powerful leader. He reached out in healing to this man's daughter. And the woman who was obscure, probably it says was very poor because she had used all her money trying to get well. Jesus reached out to her because of her faith. He calls us to be that kind of hospitable congregation and welcoming congregation. That's what Christ church on earth is. We are all sinners in need of God's grace and in need of God's healing. And one thing to notice about Jesus in this story, and I've drawn your attention to it, is his incredible compassion for people who are in need. Now, I know that this world is full of needs. There are all kinds of needs. Sometimes it gets a little bit overwhelming, I, I would say, and I would agree with you if you think that. From the refugee situation, for example, in the Middle East, people flocking to Europe to find safety, to find some kind of well-being to the hunger issues that are still plaguing too many people right here in South Dakota, and we could go on and on and on and on with the needs. The need is so great in this world that sometimes I admit that I'm ready to laugh at Jesus in disbelief and say, Jesus, this world, there's so much suffering, there's so much need, what can I do? I'm only one person. Or what can we do? We're only one congregation. And I laugh thinking, oh, we'll never be able to get it done. But then Jesus hits me upside the head with his word, and he kind of shakes me a little bit and says, Tim, with me, all things are possible. With me, all things are possible for you in your life and for this congregation as we move forward into the future that God would have us go. We're singing uh, Carry Your Candle in just a minute uh, following, uh, following the sermon. And we just finished singing with every act of love. I want to give you a homework assignment this week. In addition to your New Testament reading, I want you to thank God for the love that you've experienced. Thank God for the forgiveness in your life. Thank God for people in your life that have helped to bring to you healing, whether it be emotional or physical or whether it be spiritual, wherever that is. Thank God for it. But then your homework is this. I know you do these every single day, but be intentional. Think of something, one or two things today that you can be intentional about this week. Someone in your life who needs a simple act of kindness. With every act of love, we bring the kingdom come together with Christ. So think of a simple act of kindness that you can perform. How are you going to be carrying your candle for Christ and Christ's light this week? Be intentional about one or two people who you know are in need of a simple act of kindness. In closing, I want to read to you an article that I saw the other day about Peyton Manning. It's football season, one of my favorite times of the year. Uh, Peyton Manning, Denver Broncos quarterback, and uh, an act of love that he, uh, that he did uh, for a woman with stage 4 cancer. And I need to grab my reading glasses because this print is very small. But here's the article, real quick. I'll just read portions of it. Carrie Barnett Bolig wasn't sure if Peyton Manning would ever get her letter. Not only did he receive it, it moved him to make a grand gesture. Manning flew Bolig, who has stage four breast cancer, and her husband, Ed, out to Denver from Rock Springs, Wyoming last weekend to spend two days at Mile High Stadium which included tickets to Sunday's Broncos-Ravens game and sideline passes for beforehand. And Carrie Bolig says, I've followed Peyton Manning forever, especially being an Indiana girl where Peyton used to play. 
I just thought, well, shoot, I'm going to write him a letter and tell him how much he inspires me. It was a very personal letter on my part, and I wrote it not just because he's a football player, but because for everything he does off the field as well. It was very personal, it was very heartfelt, and I never thought of anything of it other than I wrote it and I sent it, she added. I didn't even think he would ever get it. Well, he got it all right, and she got to see the Broncos take team photos on Saturday, and Manning introduced himself, and they talked for 15 to 20 minutes in what Volig described as such a personal moment, it was a -a once-in-a-lifetime thing. He walked right over after he got his picture taken, Carrie said. It was so sweet because he shakes my hand and says, Hi, I'm Peyton Manning. It was so cute. It was kind of like, I know who you are, Peyton. (laughs) And Manning hugged Bolig before she left, and he told her this, Keep fighting, Carrie. God is with you. I'll be praying for you. Keep fighting, Carrie. God is with you. I will be praying for you. Now, I know that... You and I don't have the same platform that a Peyton Manning has. We don't have the same resources that a Peyton Manning has to fly people around the country. But you have a platform, and I have a platform, and you have resources, and God has given you gifts to use for simple acts of kindness and simple acts of love. I know people that you don't know. You know people that I don't know. Your platform is different than mine, but we all have a platform in which we can shine the light of Christ to those who are in need. So how is that going to happen for you this week? Think about it. Make it a point each and every week, each and every day. Who can I bring a simple act of kindness, big or small? The very first words Jesus speaks in the Gospel of Mark are these, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe. The kingdom of God is at hand. That means the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ is at hand right here, right now. He's in our midst and he says it's at hand. There's an urgency about it. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next week. Don't wait till next month. It's time for you right now to pack up and follow me. And in following him, it's carrying our candle for Christ. And it is performing simple acts of love for one another. It is good news. And I know, and I'm sorry that the world sometimes laughs at the Christian message. But you know what? We have the task of sharing that good news with this world so that their laughter will be turned into amazement at what God is doing. It makes me smile. And it makes me laugh with joy to think that God has chosen the likes of us to partner with him in the kingdom kingdom of God and to bring it about in this world. So may God bless you this week as you know of Christ's love in your life and you let it shine for others in his name. Amen.